but uh, we only have an hour, so I think uh, we should start. Uh, people will uh, continue to join in uh, during the, the first quarter, I think. Uh, so, Eva, I want to say welcome to you at first. Thank you so much. This is really finishing off our AI Sweden Partner Week. And uh, now we're doing a live broadcasted uh, podcast here with uh, Brian Reamer from uh, MIT, researcher at MIT. But before we start with the podcast, if I want to turn to you, uh, the podcast and bridging the gap, what is this? So this podcast concept is a series of podcasts where we will invite very interesting people like Brian today. Um, to get and dig a little bit deeper into connecting two different dots. And that's the bridging the gap part of, of the podcast. And it could be um, the Nordics and Silicon Valley. It could be in technology from um, just apps to deep tech or from entrepreneurs to funding uh, and different things like that. So that's the concept, really connecting two dots, see how we can find ways bridging these different uh, dots. Yeah, and we will have a big focus on AI, artificial intelligence, due to the fact that both of us work for AI Sweden, yep. but we also have a, a special interest in entrepreneurship and in startups and scale-ups. So there will be a lot about that. And Ebba, for the people who doesn't know you. Yeah, so Ebba Josefsson Lindqvist. I work as a project manager for the data factory at AI Sweden. Uh, but I'm also a director of Nordic Nodes of the organization called Silicon Vikings, which is a networking organization supporting innovation and uh, startup scale-ups in tech, uh, but really a networking organization to try to help everyone from the Nordics who are interested in tech and uh, entrepreneurship to also connect with Silicon Valley and the headquarters over there. And it really goes both ways. Um, so that's the main purpose of the organization. And that's why we are also powered by Silicon Vikings with this uh, podcast series. Yeah, but now we're, today we're switching coast to the uh, East Coast uh, with Brian Reamer. So welcome Brian to uh, the podcast series, Bridging the Gap. Thank you, happy to join. Yeah, uh, and Ebba, you've been working a, a bit with Brian and his teams in the data factory and in the Edge Lab. What would you like to say or highlight about Brian? Um, I think what well, I mostly heard about Brian first from uh, our colleague Mats Nordlund, and there has really only been good and very amazed words about Brian and who he is and his research. Um, so I think we will get a chance to hear at least a tiny bit of that research today. <clears throat> so that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, so Brian, you're a researcher uh, at uh, MIT and you're, you're, you've specialized in the uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, looking at drivers and, and the human interaction with machines. So that's what we're gonna dig deeper into today. Uh, but please, uh, for the people who doesn't know you in and listening in on this, uh, where did it all start? How come, uh, how come you're a researcher today at MIT? So um, a little over 20 years ago, um, I was working on my doctoral work in some early days of driving safety research related to eye movements and cell phone conversations. This is you know, at the forefront of when we were starting to talk on phones and cars. And you know, fast forward two decades later, um, I've led you know, several initiatives and some very interesting work around driver distraction. Um, which we really now like to reframe in the context of, of really, you know, inattention in the car, distractions being one form of inattention, important one, um, and moved in the last decade or so as we've looked towards the explosion of automation, both the assistive automation and, and the, the high automation areas, really over into most of my work work focusing in that area. In the early days of efforts here in automation, um, I, I gave a keynote at the second driverless car summit when there were a couple hundred people in Detroit focused on this topic. Um, I was asked to, to provide some human factors perspective on this. So, you know, there weren't a whole lot of folks around working on this topic. And now we look at these synergies and explosions, investments in AI, and this is, you know, a multi-billion dollar investment area every year. And I say investment because I, I don't think it's reached the context of really a true business where you have 
you know, investments and revenue. Um, there's very little revenue to be gained at the current time here. Um, I think we're many decades um, from sustainable businesses. Um, although we'll continue to hear forecasts, you know, trying to trying to keep the investment community happy about how fast this is going to happen. But I think it's going to really be, you know, many years. But the future is very clear. We are moving slowly towards a much more highly automated mobility ecosystem. Um, the only question is how fast can we get there? Okay. And then we have the. Now you say automated, and then we have the autonomous. And I think that's kind of the focus that we will have here today. That's gonna to be the two dots. How can we get from the one to the other? And of course we need to experience and see where we are today. Yeah. Or will we get from the one to the other? To the other? I think that's a really a good question, will. Because I think that first of all, we, we, we very much confuse all the time the terms automated versus autonomous. In its simplest level, I'd like to boil it way down. Automated means there's automation helping us. Autonomous tends to mean we're not involved. And when I say we're, I mean the human component. And it is you know, fairly unlikely that we will see highly autonomous systems anytime soon. There are going to be humans, even in back offices, involved with these vehicles as they get deployed at scale. So we're really talking about a highly automated system for the foreseeable future, not an autonomous system. And I think that one needs to remember when the J3016 um, committee formed what we want currently is the SAE levels of automation. Um, you know, level five automation is a system that can go anywhere, anytime a human would. It is really meant to be the general AI problem. I wanna travel from the East Coast of the United States to Barrow, Alaska, it doesn't matter the weather, the system can take me there. That's well outside of our engineering capability today, and I suspect for many, many decades to come. What is much more likely is we see highly automated systems, whether that's robo taxis, package delivery, freight, that work within ever increasing boxes. The box being some kind of operational domain. And this is what the, you know, the context of level four is, whether that's weather geofencing or weather or geofencing or, or other limitations on the system, well, that remains to be seen. It'll start small, um, you know, China, Arizona and other places in the world. We just saw in the news that you know, there's some driverless vehicles being tested in Beijing. It'll take many decades to really unfold until it really shapes the mobility of the masses. And I say that because, you know, at least in, in the middle of Sweden, when you, when you get away from the coast, much like the middle of the U.S., there's a lot of land and a lot of space between people. And, and you know, highly complex systems may aid us in some areas, but take a long time to creep the masses in the middle. And, and the complexities here will take time to overcome. So you're saying a few decades away. I think uh, like general people would think maybe it's just a couple of few years ago. That was the tone was uh, just a, a few years ago, but decades. So maybe it's we're kind of realizing that this is the, this is the reality we're facing. And, not, and remember when I say decades, I don't mean until there's you know, a testing vehicle in city A or city B. I really mean until it impacts how we live and move mm -hmm. at a scale that is actually meaningful. I mean, you know, something that impacts 0.0x percent of the vehicle's miles traveled, you know, is a research R&D development that's evolving. When we start talking about multiple percentages of the VMT, now we're talking about something that's taking shape. But at this time, this is an incredible investment opportunity with absolutely unknown risks, not a business entity that has a, a foreseeable projectable revenue model. You're talking about it as an investment opportunity, but still we see a lot of businesses really painting out the vision of, of uh, autonomous vehicles. And we even talk about this as a, an entire research field and, and might be even field of business. What's the, 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 what's the gap there? there? Why do we um, why do we talk about the, these visions? Well, unless you have a vision, you're not going to have an investment. And you know, in in the hard part is that you know, to date, 
you know, we keep setting expectations on timelines and, and we're not going to meet those because timelines are set on, you know, in, in a solvable engineering framework. Uh, the project plan says I can get to X. The hard part is, is that these, you know, the further and closer we get to large scale deployable, deployable solutions, the harder and harder it's going to be solved the, you know, to solve the last percent, the last 2%. You know, we've solved a lot of the complex problems, but there's a lot more of the hard problems to come. So, you know, these, you know, it will grow slowly over time if we're successful. If we don't bring in some regulatory guardrails and, and ensure that the system is operating safely and, and, and regulated in reasonable ways, we're unlikely, as I talked about in my TEDx talk a couple of years ago, unlikely to see these benefits as fast. I think the, you know, the, the ethical context of, of highly automated vehicles harming humans is, is a major barrier we're going to have to overcome. And we need to ensure and build in the guardrails for that today. Right now, it's it's very much a move as fast as you can culture. And, and I think that that may work in China um, where we, we put different value on harm than it's gonna work in Sweden or the US. I think one of the big gateways we need to think about here um, is how safe is safe enough um, in the context of these systems. You know, if our view is vision zero, which I have an enormous amount of respect for, um, developing a robotic infrastructure that harms no one um, is a very, very, very difficult um, objective. If um, you, we are more accepting of harm, um, you know, if we even were to go as far as saying a system that is only as safe as we are today, although the, the harm would change around a little bit as robotic error would be different than human error, we're starting to talk about you know, a gateway to a new mobility model that is more achievable, okay? And I say that because is the stronger and, and better performing the system, the fewer mistakes the system can make, the greater the engineering challenge to dot every single I and cross every single T as we develop and test the system. And you as a researcher, you've been very focused on, on the human-centric development. Um, so what are the challenges we do face in the development of, of um, automated vehicles? So that's, that's really a good question. And, and I think it, you know, a lot of the developments here, but not all, a lot of developments are very focused on the technology of sensing, um, path planning, and the like. The reality, however, is these robots really need to work with each and every one of us. And, and quite frankly, there's three of us talking here today and we're not the same. We're not looking for the exact same mobility experience. And as soon as we, we all walk out of our houses and, and look at, at, the, at, at others moving around in society today, we realize that there is a great disparity in, 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 in needs for mobility, whether that's an older individual looking to get to the doctor's office or go shopping or, uh, a younger child looking to go to school um, or somebody looking to head to work, you know, the robots aren't going to seamlessly provide this mobility experience and need for all of these groups. So we really need to support humans and be looking for the technology to support us. Now, to support us, we have to build trust in this new model where, as I mentioned earlier, things will operate a little differently. You know, robots aren't going to break laws the same way as a taxi driver will rush to get you to a meeting. Um, you know, we're going to have to be thinking about how does that child and how does the custody of that child transition from me putting a, one of my daughters in the seat at my house to someone getting her out at school? Okay. You know, what does the interface inside of the vehicle look like so I am comfortable about the decisions that it's making? Because, you know, it may go a different way than I expect, and I have nobody to ask. You know, what kind of feedback am I looking for? How jerky or, you know, or how smooth must this experience be as we look at the acceleration characteristics of the system? You know, on the back end side of this, you know, how do we develop the backend capabilities so that the system works flawlessly and is able to meet the needs when, when if you know, a model like an Uber app, I call for a system and, and want a vehicle that's human driven or not? What are the social dilemmas looking to cross the road in front of a human driven vehicle versus a robot? You know, are we going to yield to the robot in the same way as we might yield to it? to a human looking to inch forward through an intersection. These are the complexities, or are we gonna get madder at robots that do things we don't expect? 
Mm -hmm. These are just all the complexities that we're going to have to continue to work through here. But so what I think is really interesting with, with your research is the connection between psychology then and the behavior part of how humans behave and then the technology side. And can you let us know a little bit more how you have been working together across these sectors? Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the real strong foundations that, that I've brought to um, the work the team and I are doing you know, over the last several decades, is this is really a, a, a cross-disciplinary sport. Um, there is not one discipline itself that can solve any highly complex problems. And, and traditionally, a lot of the time, but not all the time, in academic entities, we often look at it from, you know, the academic perspective we're coming from. So the engineers look at it from a mechanical engineering perspective, or the computer scientists from that side, or the psychologists from, from, from their perspective. But I really feel very strongly that we need to be looking at this all together from a multidisciplinary perspective. We need to understand the computer vision and computer scientist viewpoint. We need to understand the engineering viewpoint. And we really need to understand the psychologist viewpoint together. And only if we can really discuss that openly, will we actually be able to drive deeper into the insights and knowledge that is needed you know, to develop long-term products that can shape how we live and move effectively. You know, too much of the time, I'm we'll referring to some of the work we do and, and, and the AVT consortium, which I founded at MIT several years ago, too much of the time we look at engineers testing systems on engineers. Hey, we're looking to build a system to a performance standard. The reality is that performance standard doesn't necessarily reflect how we as humans, users interact with the system. So we need to really cross that. Where do we need to pull the user forward? Because you know, we do have engineering constraints. You know, move the user's mental model. And, and where does the designer's mental model really need to bend to that of the users? You know, theory and automation would, would highly suggest that, that most of the time it's the designer's model that's going to have to move the furthest. You know, we as humans are creatures of habit. We don't change as quickly as we'd like to. Um, behavior change is very difficult. Um, but in some cases, we do need to be, build the educational foundations to move us and shape us over time. And I think when the benefit is there and we can clearly see the benefit, you know, humans, drivers, consumers are willing to change. But it's very important to see the benefit, feel the benefit. And that's one of the reasons many of you have heard me talk so much about level two automation. This is uh, Volvo's pilot assist, Tesla's autopilot, GM's super cruise here in the States and why that's such an important technology innovation to move the consumer's understanding forward and how automation and assistive driving can help support better decisions over time, more convenience, more comfort in the car. So if I can actually ask like more uh, in detail, what are the psychologists parts of this? Um, I saw one of your talks uh, that you did a couple of years ago here in, in Sweden and uh, where you were sh showing a few film clips of how people behave uh, in the car when a certain situation happened. So have you used a psychologist to look at the materials that you have collected and then uh, transferring that to the engineers or, or how does that collaboration really work? So you know, one can think about, and at least in the, in the team that, that I have, and there's so much cross-disciplinary you know, efforts between really strong teams. And, and, and you know, many of the industry players out there have very, very strong cross-disciplinary teams. But in, in the group that I work primarily with, you know, the AI scientists are developing algorithms to extract data and understand you know, the perception problems and the post-processing problems. The psychologists are deep in, in thinking through that data and modeling that data. And then we, you know, we do have some engineers in the team. We're thinking about how do you transition that into building things and doing things. You know, so psychologists and especially experimental psychology in particular is very deep understanding how we behave with things. But the long and short of the traditional psychology experiment was a lab experiment where you begin to control all the factors. When we look at driving behavior like we are in the United States right now and within the ABT consortium, you know, naturalistic driving behavior, we can't control many factors at all. We maybe control what vehicle you're driving, but everything else is just watching what unfolds. And, and whether that's raining and snowing or that's the decisions that we make moment to moment, whether I want to pick up the smartphone in the car, or I want to turn on the automated driving system or assisted driving system, 
or quite frankly, I'm on a country road in the middle of a beautiful sunny summer day and I wanna just drive right now. You know, you know, there's so many different pieces of metadata coming together here to try to weed through and understand. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're also mentioning in your talks and in your research a lot about trust, because that we have trust in the machines or trust in the systems. Have you looked deeper into what builds and create trusts? So we know that trust builds over time from experiences that we, you know, that align with our mental model. So when, you know, when things happen how I expect, we generally begin to trust things over time. As soon as things happen that, you know, are in contrast to my perception of what the situation should be, we begin to erode trust. Trust takes a lot longer to build than it does to erode. And again, I use the word perceptions of what the system is in, uh, in specific, because even if the system works as it's supposed to, but my perceptions are it's something different, I'm eroding trust. And that's why the education system around highly automated technologies or assistive technologies is so important. We need to understand and calibrate trust by ensuring your perceptions of what the system is going to do are aligned. As soon as this thing, system starts doing things we don't perceive are correct, hmm, what's going on here? Can I trust it? You know, we experience that day to day in our smartphones. I mean, even today, and then I'll use my favorite Windows story here. You know, do I trust Windows? No, I still get Windows blue screens of death every once in a while. You know, I trusted Windows actually three or four years ago more than I do today. Yeah. You know, so, you know, the ultimate model here is, you know, of, of how much can I trust my life in, in technology? Yeah. And with experiences like that, that also confirms your distrust in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so looking at the, just for the listeners, uh, we want to clarify that, that AVT stands for uh, Advanced Vehicle Technologies, uh, and, and that is uh, a part of the work you've been doing at MIT, uh, started that institution, started that lab. Uh, but looking at the area today, because you started a long time ago, uh, where are we today with um, automated driving or, or in our goal towards uh, autonomous vehicles? Um, in our goal towards autonomous vehicles, we are much closer to the front door than we are in the middle of the room. Um, I think we have a long way to go. We are perhaps much further along in the technology development side um, versus the, what I would consider the true enablers, the business cases and the policies that are needed. Um, I do believe, I mean, first of all, you know, all of what I talk about here, I do believe the long-term future of how we live and move is highly automated. I'm not sure it's autonomous, but highly automated. Um, I, you know, I do believe that humans will remain in control of red stop switches for a long, long, long time. Um, and, and again, red stop switches means that there's high automation and the human is still in the loop. Um, but the enablers that we need to, to accelerate here are not the technology. I think the technology will continue to evolve slowly. Um, and, and, and slowly in, in the timeframes of what the true business models for economic success look like. Okay, Remember, you know, if we think about robo taxis in particular, we're trying to replace, you know, subsidized Uber trips um, or even taxi trips with a, you know, a highly complex mobility ecosystem. You know, complexities come with costs. Um, this is not just the vehicle costs and sensors on the vehicle. This is all the back end um, and continued validation, cleaning costs, et cetera. You know, the driver does more um, you know, than, than actually pilot the vehicle from point A to point B. You, know, you leave your coffee cup behind in, 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 the, in the Uber or the cab. You know, they have a tendency to grab that. Um, if something's rattling in the front end, they have a tendency to perceive that and schedule some service, um, et cetera. But I think some of the harder questions are the policy ones. And, and, and my friends in the UK government are asking some of these really tough questions within the law commission right now. How does the regulatory policies need to change to permit highly automated transport, but ensure that legal requirements, um, you know, whether that depending on where in the world you are, whether that's pre-market certification, um, or, or a more 
a less you know um, pre-certified you know solution you know how's that going to work um who's responsible when um is it an operator is it a manufacturer where do the streams of liability go um when something does go wrong you know you know in the u.s you know how is it you know the what how is the regulatory agency that governs vehicles today NHTSA, going to relate to this um, in other parts of the country, uh, you know, the world, I should say, I think that, you know, very much we may see new regulatory agencies built to work effectively with software systems, not hardware. I mean, we got to really think here that these cars, while having physical form and function, are much more software systems that are changing with updates and software iterations, you know, very quickly. And, and this is where some of the work that I'm doing with MOTS and the Edge Lab um, and, and others here and co-leading the development of a new initiative there and edge learning really takes shape is that we are gonna be using the sensors in these vehicles and these systems to learn more and more at the edge. We, we can't move all the data around. And, and as we do that, how do we learn? How do we assemble models? How do we distribute knowledge? And how do we ensure that, you know, we are making the ethical decisions that we need to make. We are making the safety decisions, the environmental decisions and weighing that all together. Um, you know, and, you know, there's no one easy answer here. And, and, and the interaction between the public and private sectors here, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in China, you know, are at their infancy. And that is going to be harder to pave the path forward successfully um, than the technology. And I say that because when things go, go, when things go wrong, and, you know, Murphy's Law is they will go wrong. Hopefully, we, 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 it's a long time before we see another tragedy like um, Uber several years ago in Tempe. But when they do go wrong, folks are gonna point fingers and it's going to have a higher percentage, you know, probability of derailing the system if the regulatory pieces aren't there. Um, you know, not surprisingly, there will be some country in the world where the fatality numbers are just too high to bear. Now, what is that? Is that, you know, three people in a year, that 10 people in a year, or is that all the way up in, in the hundreds? Who knows? You know, we, we haven't really had these discussions yet. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask if, if that was part of what your uh, connection with uh, psychologists, if, if that discussion was included in that as well, like human behavior and what's a to tolerable. I mean, it's one of the most uh, common questions in philosophy, right? Would you save one or save 10? Yeah, uh, that, you know, that's do that question. It's a really important problem. It's not one we are working on. It's one that, that I think that society, in, you know, in, at least the industrialized world, perhaps U US, Europe, um, you know, really should come together and be talking about, um, you know, should you save one or should you save 10, you know, you know, or better yet, the one that, you know, the, the, the ends of ones we different than they are today, but can we deal with, you know, robotic error that harms one for robotic benefits that save 50. And, and, you know, again, today we look at human error as the problem. 90 plus percentage uh, uh, of accidents relate to human error. You know, we as humans accept human error. We need to remember that, you know, even when robots are roaming the roads, they're programmed by humans who are working with human level assumptions, et cetera. And you know, where do we, where do we ethically bind these decisions? Um, this is where governments need to help. This is where the ethicists need to help. And this is a psychology question, it's basics. Yeah. Who would you say are in the driver's seat right now? Who's driving the development in this field? Well, look, I think the, the folks at Waymo, Google are still the leaders driving here. There are some fast followers. I mean, clearly um, efforts globally, in, in whether that's Motional in the US, that's Aurora or, or um, Argo, GM's Cruise, some of the efforts in China, um, some you know efforts even you know, uh, in, into Sweden, um, and close to, to your home in Gothenburg. The, the reality is though, I think that we are still chasing the initial effort Google um, pushed forward from a technology perspective. Um, I think they are still the leaders, um, you know, and, and there will continue to be very fast followers here globally. I mean, I think if you look at companies globally, I think they're most, you know, very interesting. I think Mobileye is in a very interesting position. I mean, very, very smart group there. Um, but I think that we're seeing a very large level of consolidation across the industry right now. Um, you know, Toyota just last week bought the, the group from Lyft that was walking on, working on EV. Um, we saw Aurora um, 
uh, acquire the Uber group. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Um, you know, when the Germans are willing to work with the Americans under Argo, I mean, Ford and VW coming together, um, very different cultures from an engineering philosophy perspective. Um, you know, I think you realize how difficult these problems are and, you know, and how long road it may be to solve them. You know, we're also seeing, we saw last week, True Simple, one of the trucking startups, um, go through an IPO, raise a billion dollars. You know, there's rumors out there that others, including Waymo, are debating this, you know, leveraging the markets to, to invest in, 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 in cement, you know, significant long-term funding. You know, some would say, well, they want to deploy faster, but the reality is I think there's a long road ahead, and they know that. Um, you know, there's no easy answers here and it's going to cost a lot to get down that road and the, the more security you bring now, the better decisions you'll be in a position to make later. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more consolidation. I think we will see more investment um, questions here, but I think it's a really in interesting investment when, when you move to, you know, looking to public markets. You know, this is really gambling at its best. You know, take true simple, um, you know, you have a billion dollars raised from the market. You know, do the investors really have any clue in what they're investing in? The answer is no. I mean, they have no real window into the technology. They have a window into somebody's marketing dream. You know, uh, you know go to um, some of these, you know, Swedish companies, whether it's Ericsson, Volvo, Vienier, um, or Autoleaf, you know, they have public balance sheets. You're investing in a company that has, you know, you know, a public documentation of what their expected revenues are, um, what their costs are, what their market forecasts are. You know, you, you have a little information to make a judge on. Um, when you invest in a pure technology startup here, you have, you have very little. And we're not talking about small tech startups here. We're talking about, you know, billion dollar valuations. And I think that that comes home as we've watched, you know, I think it was Morgan Stanley, but don't quote me, begin to, you know, to offset the original uh, forecasts on what the market cap for Waymo is and, and you watch year by year as it's falling down as, as more understanding of this technology takes shape. Can I also ask, you were touching on the regulation part of this um, and your opinion as an American, we were talking a lot here at AI Sweden, for example, and, and I have a background in law about GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and how that works or does not work uh, in the development, for example, of autonomous systems, et cetera, with data collection. Just um, because you mentioned that we need regulation, but how do we make that work um, together with innovation? So I think that's the real hard part is that we need regulation to support that everybody's moving on a reasonable, prudent, and responsible road forward, but we need to allow for the innovations um, to occur. And when we look at some of the prescriptive regulation that exists, do X, well, X doesn't you know, necessarily allow for the fact that the world continues to change. And GDPR is a great illustration. Well, you know, very, very supportive of the consumer privacy side of that. Um, the reality is, is that you can collect data with PII and protect health and uh, protect identifiable information in it very easily now. And, and the key is that we need to ensure that we're securing that and we're managing it effectively. You know, the fact that we're collecting it, it's not something we can avoid. And, and you know, the, the principles were written with good faith, but we need to evolve the principles and be very open to the world is going to continue to change as we move forward. Um, and we need to be thinking collaboratively, you know, not regulators versus industry, how do regulations support industry and support transparency that builds and helps to build trust? Yeah. And looking in, in helping building something, mm -hmm. um, looking at this space with, with advanced technologies for, for uh, autonomous vehicles or, or automated vehicles, what do you think other sectors or other industries could learn, can learn from this field of research and the businesses investing so much in this technology? Um, I, look, I think they're much like this, you know, the space race resulted in, in, in incredible develop technology development. Um, you know, I think that our pursuit of highly automated vehicles, you know, personally hope it will be very successful over you know, decades to come. 
But either way will result in a lot of technology developments that will help shape other industries. You know, let's go over to LIDAR for a moment. You know, the, this race towards autonomy is, you know, accelerating investments in productization of LIDAR. You know, will that assist, you know, traditional manually driven vehicles, um, increase, you know, the sensing awareness around the vehicle, help improve safety? What other applications might LIDAR begin to work in? If we look at the AI algorithmic development side and, and perception system development, you know, we're, we're pushing the bounds of AI with huge investments um, in automation and cars that will impact um, much, you know, lots of things outside of the vehicle. Um, and, and how important, because you're working with the Edge Lab here. So how important is Edge in, in terms of this space? So I think Edge gets to be really important when you begin to think about the current and future data stream size. We are moving around enormous amounts of data. Okay. You know, and we need to be, in, we, we are restricted whether you're, in, you know, in, in China from moving data out of China, GDPR, we're going to be in, increasingly restricted in how we want our data used and where we want it moved to and the cost of moving that data. 90 plus percent of driving data, for instance, maybe 99% is really not interesting. You know, it's the edges of the data sets that are very interesting. How do we process that, learn from that at the edge instead of moving all the data, move the models back? And I think that's really the art of edge learning is that we can begin to use incredible computing power, you know, whether it's all the way out in our smartphones or in our cars or in manufacturing centers or healthcare facilities to process data where it is really at this closer to the source or consolidated fairly close to that to learn there and then propagate the models up and, and consolidate them later on. It helps protect privacy. It helps to reduce the cost and energy consumption of moving and storing vast amounts of data. And I think it will help make AI more efficient. It's not better algorithms that we need most of the time. It's cleaner data, smarter data, and smarter use of the data that's gonna probably shape things forward more than a, you know, a better deep neural net. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the impact has is, is, is got a lot more to do with how we work with data than it does better AI algorithms. Yeah. Do, do you think that, because I know you've been talking about this earlier as well, uh, but do you think that the field might have overestimated the, the importance of, of the best models and underestimated the, the, the yeah. importance of it? <laughs> Look, this is a long number, and, 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 and I remember this 20 plus years ago in grad school, garbage in, garbage out. Um, I think the entire field is, is, is so focused on, you know, the, the lure of better models. And this is, look, I, it's not a problem. It's just, you know, academic focus. Can we do better than the last paper? And there's nothing wrong with that. But that is not going to solve the robustness and complexity of real world products and innovations that shape how we how we live. So better algorithms, yeah, well, I can invest in better algorithms or I can invest in better data. Chances are better data is gonna give you a better result, faster than a better algorithm. However, in terms of getting yourself a paper in a top tier conference, better data doesn't do it. A better algorithm will. So again, we, you know, we have this society built on different measuring sticks and then, and I think that multidisciplinary complex teams looking to solve real world problems are what we need as opposed to solving, hey, we have another math model that's a little better than the last. Yeah. You know, there is an enormous amount of technology where that's in, you know, in consumer goods or automotive or health sciences sitting on the shelf because we really need the innovations to get it to market as opposed to just needing better demonstration products. Um, and again, we need to find a healthier balance, in my opinion. Yeah. Great. So uh, we want to tell the people listening in that if you want to ask some questions, please uh, write them in the Q&A tab and we will bring them up now. Um, these last 15 minutes of the conversation with Brian. So take the chance 
send in your questions and we will read them to him. Yeah. Um, um, but but uh, what, before we do that, mm -hmm. I, I would like to continue on this path between going from a model centric uh, to a more uh, data centric and even a more human centric development of AI. What do you think are, are key features in, in, in making that trans, uh, transition, Brian? I think the, the first is a, a firm, broad realization of what are we creating these artificial systems for? Now, most of the time, we're creating the systems to support us in some way, shape, or form. We are not creating cyborg to replace us, which means that if we want to support humans, we need to be starting with a human-centric perspective. The AI side usually, you know, again, this is the disciplines working. The computer science is, you know, storming ahead and developing new AI approaches often looking this much more from the technology side as opposed to saying, oh, how do I support humans? Okay, so let's focus there first. Now, when we do that, we also need to very much remember that, you know, real school and real learning comes from real data. And, and you, know, you know, the data factory within AI Sweden is a great illustration of trying to bring data out of the woodwork where we can do real term or real you know, world modeling as opposed to spending our, all of our data creating a toy data set that is so simplified, you know, very interesting from, from that, that academic perspective, but so simplified that you really can't be transferred to the real world. You know, you know the question you know, in automated vehicles is, is it, are the multi, you know, the, the experiments we see in different cities transferable to other cities? And I think well, by and large, we know not directly. Is going to need to be different learnings as you move from the west coast of the U.S. to the east coast of the U.S. You know, like we don't drive perfectly the same. The roads aren't striped in exactly the same ways. And there we're really talking about the infrastructure. But staying on that topic, we got a question here from from this from Mats Nulen actually uh, about what are the key things needed to make people feel safe when riding in an autonomous vehicle or listening to you and automated vehicles. So what, what are the key things? Expectations, expectations, expectations. If I ex <laughs> what happens is what I expect. I'm going to feel comfortable. You know, as soon as what happens is outside of my expectations, not too comfortable with the situation. It's an out of control feeling. So, you know, if the vehicle takes me on the route I expect, great, it's doing what I think. If it jerks and stops in, in response to a light pole, not what I expect. So, you know, it really needs to be nailed very well which means that it is much easier for us to rush to deployment of this technology before it's ready, because you know, we got to think about how do we make money faster here, eroding expectations, and humans are really good, first impressions matter a ton. If I try this, it doesn't work how I expect. It's really easy. We're pretty good at putting it down and going a different direction. You know, much like going to a restaurant, and trying a new dish. If you love it, you order it again. If you don't, you don't pick anything like it. Yeah. That's true. And I, and I guess that uh, comes back to the education part that you mentioned also earlier. And, and education, education is going to just take time and, and time and coordination between all the different partners in play. Having worked in hospitality, we had the, the first impression, highest impression, lowest impression, and last impression <laughs> as a, a, a methodology where we had to keep them as high as possible, uh, even the lowest ones. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, on staying on the same topic, actually, and a question from P Priya here, with the coming of AI, do you see we will be having psychologist requirements or, or psycholo psychologist requirements managers like we had usability, for example, in, in, in the rest of technology. But will we have like psychology requirements in AI? Well, no, quite frankly, that's the human factors engineers coming in to, to look at it from an engineering perspective. Um, I think there, you know, there is a, a, a going to be, and this is the background I come from, and I guess it's being in the right place, the right time in some sense, or, 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 or marking a little bit, there's going to be an explosion of need for human factors engineering. 
Um, how do we build the interfaces, the psychology of the situation? Um, human factors engineering is the, you know, the closest discipline in engineering to psychology. And that is the psychologist on staff. And, 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 and so it is not a new area. Um, it's just you know, an ever increasing important area. Um, and you know, I watch the job posts in the US. Um, we don't have the education system to build and train the level of human factors engineers that are required. So it's an area where you know, there weren't a lot of jobs a decade or two ago. And, and man, there's an awful lot around, not an education system to build. Um, you know, we were much better off at engineering, uh, educating AI scientists because we built that education system in, in many senses. You know, you know, I think we'll, we'll look back 10 or 20 years from now, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, an issue in the U.S. where there's too many law programs and we're graduating too many lawyers uh, for the number of law jobs. And you, one's got to wonder a couple decades in the distance from now, how are we graduating too many AI scientists because we, we rushed to fill a need beyond what was what the true expectations of the profession were. Yeah. So, so what really are the needs today? What does the industry or, or uh, research field need? I, look, I think th there's no question we need more strong engineers, whether that's from you know, the computer science side, the, the human factor side. The question for me becomes is, you know, you know what does the tell on the AI side look like? Um, in, you know, a lot of the work is becoming less about programming in new as opposed to scripting and rebuilding. So it's more of a, you know, a, a, a line engineering job as opposed to a high-end research job. And how is that going to shape over time? Um, you know, how do we move from building demonstrations to building product? Um, you know, are these big companies going to move and reshape themselves. I mean, you know, auto industry is a great example here. We've been come really good at building products that are sold that, that, you know, have a three to five year lifespan. And then I want you to buy a new one. The future of the auto industry, you know, as Tesla is demonstrating uh, best right now is upgradable products, you know, software changes, you know, that are going to occur over time. And, and, and what are the pieces? Well, that's, you know, that's less manu you know, mechanical engineering, um, you know, perhaps even less electrical engineering, more software, usability, user interface design, shaping, et cetera. You know, what are we virtually able to change? And those technology shifts are also impacting the, the business side and the business model of the industry. Uh, but looking at education, because we also got a question in terms of how, what the consumer, or in this case, the driver needs to understand. So, so with this technology shift, do you also see a need for education when you get, for example, your driver's license to, to shift or to change? But that's gonna be the new driver's license. Yeah. It, 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 you know, look, Many of us, the last real formal driver education we got was when we got our driver's license. The reality is the car is far different today, supported by vastly different technologies. Um, and we're bringing new things in the car that we wouldn't even have dreamed about. Um, you know, who would guess that the context of automatic transmissions, automating the shifting of gears would have made it so easy to take your hands off the, the clutch and the steering wheel, the text on a phone, you know, you know but it's automation at its basics. So, you know, I, you know, I do think that governments in particular, and this is not something that will be, you know, politically uh, um, friendly, you know, governments need to be looking at continuing education credits context for driver's license. You know, even the basics of ensuring that folks understand what new technologies are out there and your end cap being an illustration of a great organization pushing that, even if there was a requirement to get a very modest amount of of education about the technologies, you could set the market off much better than looking for everybody to go backwards compatible. So, you know, look, whether that's terminology, AEB, the importance of AEB, the fact that, you know, assistive driving systems are not self-driving, you know, are, are meant to be overseen, you know, some very basic pieces can help influence people greatly. No perfect answers, but, you know, you know, we need some help here. Yeah, yeah. And just as software and, and for example, the Teslas needs an update uh, sometimes and you can buy an update or get an update. We as humans need an update in our skills <laughs> uh, and skills. And that, that update is through education. 
but but looking at uh, the job sector and I'm looking at uh, doing, for example, I know that we saw a research from, I think it was McKinsey and this is no knowledge, but uh, being a driver is the most common wor- uh, job in the world. Uh, how will this technology and the technology shift affect jobs, do you think? And what are what is our responsibility in terms of, of that affecting jobs? So, you know, as we move towards a highly automated um, mobility ecosystem, you know, we are going to transform um, the job market that's needed to support that. Okay, that means, you know, again, decade shifts in, in truck drivers and in Uber drivers, um, but new professions that are going to be built into the system. So instead of driving the vehicle, you're going to have more people cleaning trash out of cars. You're going to have more people focused on sensor validation in the morning, sensor cleaning, ensuring replacing sensors, you know, technician, you know, and not, not the old fashioned auto repair side, looking to change oil and brakes, but literally technicians, changing sensors that no longer pass, you know, you know, the daily and, you know, testing regimen. You're going to have back office responsibilities that are taking shape in engineering roles there that are vastly different. Um, you know, perhaps someday the, the pizza will be loaded into the, you know, the pod automatically, but for, for the foreseeable future, if we succeed in delivering it automated, you're still going to have someone making the pizza and put it in there. And, and quite frankly, if it comes to my house easier, I'm likely to buy more of it. So, you know, reshape consumer demand. Yeah, yeah. You know, you want fresh vegetables if they get delivered without even going to the grocery store and all I have to do is click a button, you know? Yeah. The reality is, is that's going to shape how we, how we buy things. Yeah. So I think we have to embrace the fact that jobs are going to change, which, you know, again, goes back to the training side. We need to retrain workforce. But we, you know, in, in some of these areas, you know, truck drivers in the States being a great long-term area, we don't have enough workforce. We need to, you know, we have some issues here to start with, but we need to embrace that there are vast changes um, to the employment you know, structure of transportation jobs um, and transportation jobs become very broad here um, coming over the, you know, the, the decades ahead. And I think we want to finish this talk by going diving even deeper into the, the technology space and the data space. So, so looking at the field of AI, what do you see as the next hot, big emerging technology in and around AI? Um, I think it's less about, you know, a, a quote unquote technology, more about using AI to actually do things that support us. You know, you know, you look at how much AI is in the smartphone. I think we're going to see more and more products coming to market based upon the foundations of AI that help us do things, make life more convenient, intuitive, fun, and enjoyable. Um, you know, as opposed to you know the products sh- sitting on shelves. I think the enabler here, at the end of the day, it is you know something is a global shortage right now, but the microchips and the processing power that is being put into very small form factor technologies is going to allow us to create lots of little gadgets um, that are fun to have in life that shape our experiences, both in the home, the car and the workplace. Um, So I think, you know, there's gonna be a lot more smart technology surrounding us. It's going to generate more and more data. It's going to require us to become much smarter in how we use the data. You know, our our, you know, our last few decades of, of, of just storing everything, um, we're not making efficient use of our data. Every piece of data needs to be used differently. You need to understand the data to use it effectively. And, and the whole data sciences area um, will likely explode with this. Um, how to personalize the technology, to let us do some of the stuff we want to do, and make life more enjoyable. Um, as we come out of the pandemic and, and we re-emerge more socially. Um, I think we're gonna be vastly different people using technology, incredibly different. So, you know, if we wanna look at, at the silver lining to a, a, a horrible, um, you, know, you know, pandemic, loss of life, it, it's tragic, um, loss of opportunity, horrific. Um, you know, what, do we, what is the silver lining? Our experience and our interactions with technology have changed dramatically over the last year. 
are accepting of, of technology or communication mechanisms, how we communicate is gonna change a lot more in the next couple decades as well. I think some of the things you mentioned here, Brian, is also segues to another episode that will come out of this podcast series, a uh, conversation we have with Adam Shire, who uh, was one of the founders of Siri Inc. Uh, and really how using AI technology and communications, it's just another example of that. Yeah. But we really want to say thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It yeah. was really great uh, to hear your thoughts and insights on this, and we'll see if we could have a, a betting at some point on, on when automated goes to <laughs> autonomous. And, yeah. to and really, I, it, we might not do that because it's about expectations, expectations, expectations. Right. Um, I can't think about a better way to, to uh, pause this uh, conversation because, Brian, I, I feel that we really need to get back to you. But on the topic of, of getting this technology or using this technology so that we can enjoy life even more and to be even more human. Yeah, I think that's, you, you, you hit it really well. We need to use the technology to support us. It's not technology for technology's sake. We're humans building systems to make our lives better. Um, and with that, I think, you know, hopefully before too long, the, the, the great uh, aviation technologies will get me across the Atlantic Ocean and, and, and be able to visit you guys all in Sweden again. We are looking forward to that, Brian, and then we be, uh, will be much much more people in in a room together uh hopefully so thank you so much ebba thank you peter thank you so thank much you, brian, brian. Uh, and we hope to talk Go to on. you soon again thank you bye thank you and Thank you to the people that joined us in the chat. I hope you got uh, the answers to all of your questions that you asked. Uh, if there's even more uh, uh, questions, just email us then uh, for the next episode of uh, the podcast and you will find our contact details on ai.se. Exactly. And Brian, if people want to reach you, where do they uh, best reach you? Um, my email address is reamer, R-E-I-M-E-R, -E at mit.edu. Um, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.